to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Let there be no divisions among you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 10. We welcome you today to our study of the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ, and why it is not a modern-day denomination. We're so glad that you've joined us, and we want you to know that we're happy that you've tuned into our broadcast. We hope that you'll get your Bible and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God as our only authority in all matters today. Friend, we want to encourage you to visit the Church of Christ in your area, whether it be for their Sunday morning or Sunday night worship or Wednesday Bible study. They'd be glad to have you at any of their assemblies. You'll find people there who, who love God, who are concerned about lost souls, and who more than anything want men and women to go to heaven. If you'd like to study more about the church or the plan of salvation, they'd be happy to sit down and discuss the Word of God with you. Friend, we're also here at the Gospel of Christ, happy to help you in any way in your study of the Word of God. Check out our website thegospelofchrist.com. From our website, you can find a wide variety of good Bible study material. We have audio lessons, video lessons, written material, study questions, and the good news is it's all available free. If you'd like to have a copy of this lesson or any of our past lessons, you can get a digital download by going to our website, filling out our media request form, and we'll be happy to send that to you. Also, if you'd like a hard copy of a DVD or CD, we make those available as well. Just contact us at the information given, and we'd be glad to provide that to you. And friend, in our fast-paced world today, we'd love to encourage you. We encourage you to check out our mobile app, both in the Apple Play and the Android Store in both of our respective stores. It's free of charge, and it's a great way to study the Word of God on the go. Today we're thinking about why the Lord's Church is not and must not be a denomination. And we began with 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10 where the Bible clearly says, Let there be no division among you. Why is it that the church we read about in the Bible is not, must not, and cannot be a denomination? Well, here's why. Denominationalism divides the body of Christ. And friend, that's not God's will. The Bible says, let there be no divisions among you. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. Division is contrary to what God wants. God doesn't want division. God wants unity. Psalm 133 verse 1. The Bible says that they may all be joined together in unity. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Ephesians 4 verse 3, we're to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And I want you to notice what Jesus said in John 17 verse 20 and 21. Our Lord died for and He prayed for His people to be unified. Look in John 17 verse 20 and 21. Notice what the Bible says. Jesus prayed this. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus prayed and he pleaded that his followers would be unified. What's wrong with denominationalism? It divides. It naturally divides the body of Christ. 
You cannot have division and denominationalism and go along with the plan of God. When you've got a person over here following this man and his teaching, and another person over here following this man and his teaching, and another place teaching another, and all this division, when you've got three to 5,000 religious groups, all of different flavors, teaching a different thing with different ideas, does that look like we're unified? Jesus said that they all may be one, that the world may believe you sent me. What kind of message does denominationalism proclaim? It doesn't proclaim the unity that Jesus wants among his people. And so the church must not be a denomination because it divides the body of Christ. Secondly, the Lord's church, the church you read about in the Bible, is not a denomination because denominationalism is not authorized anywhere in the Bible. Meaning this, nowhere in the New Testament do we find God's approval or God's saying that denominationalism is okay. And I know sometimes people ask, well, does God have to say that? Well, friend, Christians are only to operate off of what God tells them to, right? We don't operate off of, well, it might be okay with God, or God might not mind this, or, or this is probably all. No, that's not the way we operate. Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever we do, in word or deed, we're to do all in the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, verse 17. You see, Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth, Matthew chapter 28. And the Bible tells us that we are to operate off of that authority. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6, Paul said that we're not to go beyond what is written. You know, if there's a passage I wish we could drive home, it'd be this one. Paul said he, he had transferred some things to himself and Apollos figuratively, that in their sakes that we may learn not to go beyond what's written. Did we hear that? Christians are not to go beyond the bounds of what's written. Where do you find denominationalism in the Bible? It's not authorized. It's not in there. And so we want to ask those two great questions. Is there any word from the Lord? Romans 4, verse 3, and what does the Scripture say as well? Jeremiah 37, verse 17. And so denominationalism is just not found in the Bible, and it's not authorized. Then, my friend, we also want to realize the church cannot be, must not be a denomination because denominationalism, division, and naming after another, which is what denominationalism is at its heart and core, is explicitly forbidden in the Bible. Hear me well on this. Denominationalism is explicitly condemned in Scripture. And you say, well, where's that at? Would you open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 1? And I want you to see a, a, an example of where people tried to form denominationalism in the first century, dividing and naming it after another, and God specifically condemned that. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Notice verses 10 through 13. Paul says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and here it is, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are divisions among you. Now here's the naming after another. Now I say this, each of you says, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Friend, when we think about denominationalism be explicitly forbidden, this passage is so clear. What was going on in the New Testament? Well, these people, were you to ask them, were you to ask these people, are you a member of the one body? Well, most would have said, yeah, we're a member of the one body. We're just the sect. We're the group that follows Paul. Or I'm a follower of Apollos. He was an eloquent man. Or I'm a follower of Cephas or Peter. I can relate to him. And then others were saying, no, we're just followers of Christ. You've got people who are saying, we're part of one body. We're just the Paul branch or the Cephas branch or the Apollos branch. You know what God said about that? 
Let there be no divisions among you. Now let's bring that down to a modern parallel. Were most people pressed into saying, are you a part of the one body Jesus died? They might would say, well, sure, I'm a part of that. I'm just the sect that follows Martin Luther. Or I'm a sect that follows, you can name the individual. Or we're the sect that emphasizes repentance. The same principle in the first century applies today. Let there be no divisions among you. But friend, not only is naming it after another, denominationalism explicitly forbidden. Did you know according to this text, it's impossible? Did you notice verse 13? Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Two things are given before you could ever be a follower of any man. Did you notice those? Was Paul crucified for you? How can I be a follower if that person had to be crucified for me? Well, who could do that? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Nobody but Jesus could do that. Were you baptized in their name? Can they save you? They don't have that power or that authority. And so not only is it explicitly forbidden, no man can meet the criteria for having followers and naming a religious group after him. But friend, not only that, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ must not be a denomination because denominationalism, if it's not following the Word of God, it naturally is following the teaching of men. I want you to open to Matthew 15 and let's see what Jesus said about putting man's traditions in with God's teaching. Look in Matthew 15 and I want you to look in verses 7 through 9. Listen to what the Lord said about intertwining man's teaching and man's tradition with the commands of God. The Bible says this, Matthew 15, verse number 7. Jesus said, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, notice this, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Friend, if you can't find denominationalism in the Bible, if it's explicitly forbidden, whose teaching is it following then? Well, if it's not following God's, it's following man's. And friend, we need to realize that's not a part of God's plan. 2 John 9, whoever transgresses and goes beyond the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Denominationalism is beyond the doctrine of Christ. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, we're not to add to nor take away from the things written in the book. Denominationalism is an addition. It's not found anywhere in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6, we're not to go beyond what's written. Friend, I challenge you to do this. Would you open your Bible and find your denomination in there? Remember now, we're not to go beyond what's written. If it's not in there, it's got to go beyond that which is written. And so the Bible says in Proverbs 30, verse 6, Do not add to his word, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Let God be true, and every man found a liar. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 23. But here's the, one of the main reasons we want to mention. Why must the Lord's church not or any religious group, a person be a part of a, 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 the church of Lord Jesus Christ and not a denomination. Friend, a denomination creates unnecessary confusion and doubt among the world. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33, we're to do all, th God is not the author of confusion, and we're to do all things decently and in order. If God is not the author of confusion, think about this, okay? 3,000, 5,000 denominations exist. A person decides, I want to be a part of the church Jesus died for. And then there's a three. How are you going to? That's confusion and doubt and chaos. God's not the author of doubt. The Bible says in John 17, 20 and 21, Jesus prayed that they all may be one. Isn't that a simple plan? That's God's plan that they all may be one. Not the doubt, not the confusion. Uh, the unity of believers is to proclaim Jesus as the Son of God. Well, if unity proclaims the message of Jesus as being very powerful, what does denominationalism do? It creates doubt 
It creates confusion. It creates chaos. It's not a part of God's plan. And so we need to realize that denominationalism, its ideas are contrary to the teaching of Scripture. Now, let's notice then specifically some Bible verses. And again, we hope you've got your Bible ready to look at these with us. Let's notice some Bible verses that clearly teach division and naming groups after men is not right. Would you open to Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 4. The oneness of the Lord's church clearly teaches denominationalism is wrong. Notice Ephesians chapter 4 and notice what the Bible says in this section of Scripture. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 4, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through you all and in you all. How many bodies are there? Well, let's back up a minute. How many gods are there? Just one. How many spirits? Just one. How many faiths? Just one. How many lords? Just one. How many bodies are there? Listen to how he begins. There's one body. What is the body? The body is the church. He's the head of the body, which is His church. Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23. What's wrong with denominationalism? Friend, it's clearly against the oneness of the Lord's church. We've mentioned these passages in, in lessons past, but listen to 1 Corinthians 12, 20. The Bible says we're baptized into one body. There are many members, yet but, listen to the emphasis, yet but one body. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts in which you are called into one body. Colossians 3.15, many members, many gifts, one body. Romans 12, verses 4 through 6, over and over again, God emphasizes the oneness of His church. Friend, let's also realize the scriptural head of the church helps us to realize denominationalism is not correct. I want you to notice in your Bible, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Would you look with me in Ephesians chapter 1? We referenced it briefly, but notice what the Bible says about who is the head of the church today. That's Ephesians chapter 1. Notice verses 22 and 23. The Bible says, And He, God, put all things under His feet, now notice this, talking about Christ, and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. Who's the head of the church? Well, friend, some individual in Rome, Italy, is not the head of the church. Please hear me well. The Lord's church is not decapitated. The Lord's church does not need a head. Jesus is the head of His church. He's reigning at the right hand of God. Hebrews 1 verses 3 and 4, God's Word is already settled in heaven and there is no need for any man to be the head of a religious organization. And so any denomination that has a human head, friend, the Scriptures are clearly teaching that's not according to God's will. A couple of other passages that teach this. Acts 20 verse 28 is clearly against denominationalism. I want you to open your Bible to Acts chapter 20 and I want you to see who it is that purchased the church. Acts chapter 20. Would you look with me in verse number 28? How can we know denominationalism is contrary to the Scripture? Well, friend, this passage clearly helps us to see that. Paul said, Therefore, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, notice now, to shepherd the church of God which He purchased with His own blood. Friend, any denomination today that wears a different name than the Lord's, that follows a different pattern, that gives glory to somebody else, that's not what we find. In the Bible, the fact that Jesus purchased His church, the one church, friend, that idea is clearly 
opposed to men going out and setting up religious organizations and naming it after other people. That's just foreign to what we find in the New Testament. And then there's this. What passages help us to see denominationalism is wrong? Friend, clear passages on God's plan of salvation help us to see denominations are wrong. Acts chapter 18, verse 8. I'd like for you to open your Bible to that if you would. You're not far from it if you looked in Acts chapter 20. Flip back two chapters to Acts chapter 18 and notice God's plan of salvation in the New Testament. The Bible says, Then Crispus, the ruler of synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. And notice now, And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. What was God's plan of salvation in the New Testament? They heard the message of Jesus. They believed in Him as the Savior. They were willing to change their life and turn from sin. They repented. They confessed and acknowledged their faith in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Friend, if a religious group says any of the steps we see in the New Testament are not essential. For example, if somebody says baptism is not essential. Well, friend, that kind of teaching, denominational teaching, is opposed to Christianity. For Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. Peter said, Baptism does now also save us. If anybody teaches anything different than that, 1 Peter 3, 21, friend, that's denominational error, and that's not going to save anybody on the final day. Now let's turn our attention to this. If denominationalism is not God's plan, and the church cannot, must not be a denomination, then why would we encourage one today to leave denominationalism? Well, let me mention two or three reasons that I hope will be an encouragement today. Friend, when you leave denominationalism, you are leaving the way of error. I want you to think about a passage in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21 where Peter talks about the way of error and how people were living immorally, practicing immoral things, and involved in error. And he there said that those who turned back to that, it was like a dog returning to his own vomit, or a sow after it had been washed, returning to its wallowing in the mire. Friend, when you come out of denominational error, your life can be clean and on the right track with God. You're a part of now the one way that's right. When you obey the gospel. Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Jesus said, There is a wide way, there is a broad path, and it leads to eternal destruction. But there's a narrow path, a restricted way, and it leads to eternal life. When you leave error, you're leaving behind the broad way, the filthy way. And friend, you can be sure that you're right with God. Why should someone leave denominational error? Friend, because on that final day, Denominational error and denominational teaching and those who buy into it and don't repent of it are going to be destroyed. That's what the Lord says. Open your Bible, if you would, to Matthew chapter 15, and I want you to see the words of Jesus. Turn to Matthew chapter 15, and notice what Jesus said about those who were teaching error and practicing things that were not according to the will of God. Of the Pharisees, the blind leaders of the blind who were caught up in human tradition, Jesus said, He answered and said in verse 13, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Now I know He's not talking about plants, for Jesus said in verse 14, Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind leads the blind, they both will fall into the ditch. What did Jesus say about man's tradition, man-made ways, man-made plans? Jesus said, every plant that my father's not planted will be uprooted. They're blind leaders of the blind. Friend, when you leave denominational error, you're leaving that which is destined to be uprooted by God. That which wasn't planted by him to begin with, and that which cannot be correct according to the Scripture. And friend, ultimately, when you leave denominational error, you're going to be receiving all spiritual blessings and you're going to be on the path that leads to heaven. Think about this. Ephesians 1 verse 3 says of God's children, we have all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. We have God as our Father, 
1 John 3, verse 1. We have the avenue of prayer, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. We have a family to help encourage us, Ephesians 2, verses 14 through 16. And ultimately, you're headed on the path that leads to heaven and that will find hope in that type of lifestyle. I want you to think about this with me for just a moment. In Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37, Jesus says these words. Mark 8, verse 36 and 37. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Your soul and mine is the most important thing that we have. Realize today that as we think about these ideas, we need to know what God's plan is and we need to follow that and stay true to it in each and every way and do what God wants us to do to be right with Him and not get caught up in denominational error and what's wrong and contrary. And so friend, we want you to know today that to those who are involved in denominational error, we're concerned about lost souls. We want them to go to heaven. We want them to be right with God. And more than anything, we want them to know there is a way to get to heaven. That way is God's plan. And so we ask you today, are you a member of the Lord's church? Not a man-made religious group that can't save you anyway. Are you a member of God's church? Are you a member of the part of the church Jesus died for? People were a part of in the first century and it is one day going home to be with God forever. You say, well, I want to be a member of that. How do I become a member of the Lord's church? Well, friend, the plan is very simple. Saul of Tarsus had been doing things that were contrary to the will of God. And in Acts chapter 9, the Lord confronted Saul about that. And Saul said to him in Acts 9 verses 4 through 6, Lord, what would you have me to do? He changed his way of thinking. He believed in Jesus. He changed his way of thinking and turned from a life of sin and repented. Well, what was it Saul was told to do to be saved? In Acts chapter 22, verse 16, Saul was told, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If you're not a child of God, you're not a Christian, more than anything, we want you to become one. God loves you. We love you. If we can help you in any way, don't hesitate to contact us, and we'd be glad to study further with you. And friend, we hope and pray that you'll join us next time as we're going to study more about the Lord's church. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.